and I welcome the Community Board 2's general meeting for uh, February. Before we begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to announce um, that this meeting is being recorded as is custom with our virtual engagement and uh, our vice chairs for community board are Mr. Leonard Jordan and Ms. Barbara Zollegringer. We are um, going to proceed with the agenda as distributed. Um, and what I'd like to do is before we proceed, I'd like to make an amendment to the agenda. The agenda lists that the um, second report this evening on the item number eight would be finance and personnel. I'd like to ask that we move finance and personnel to the last committee to present. And those that are following would move up. The chair of that committee has a slight conflict and wanted to allow time for him to um, participate. So with that modification, I'll accept um, a motion to approve tonight's agenda. And to approve the adjustments. Mr. Flanoy. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Feibush. Um, all in favor, either raise your hand or signal by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Please um, indicate by the same format. Any abstentions? Please indicate by the same format. Okay, thank you. Has everyone had a chance to review the uh, minutes of January 2022? Mm -hmm. Are there any noted corrections or modifications? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand or indicate by aye. Aye. Anyone opposed, please indicate by the same format. Any abstentions? Thank you. Uh, should you have any modifications post this portion of the meeting, please send those edits into the board office. Um, at this point, before we proceed with the meeting uh, and people have had a chance to look at the agenda, uh, I want to take a motion, or take a moment, that is, to uh, see if there's any uh, comments from the public, any non-community board two members uh, who may have an item that they want us to at least focus on or pay attention to this evening. Okay, great. Hearing none, we'll proceed with um, the agenda. I do want to take a moment um, because Mr. Singletary, I saw there was an individual that is hand up, uh, Mr. Douglas Botner. Oh, thank you. Mr. Botner, if you will, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, please come off mute, and I'm happy to hear from you. Hi, Lenny. How are you tonight? Nice I'm to good. see you. Good. How are you? Neighbor, or your neighbors over at University Towers next to the hospital. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm really with Terrence, who was on the board a couple of years ago, so he's one of our residents. So I just want to say hi, everybody. Um, I'm not sure how involved the community board, I've been in and out at a couple of meetings, but um, I don't know how involved the community board is in property taxes, um, real estate property taxes, New York City property taxes, but just, just putting it out there that um, the New York City Department of Finance put out their um, notice evaluations for the 2022-23 um, year, which starts in July. And there's been a lot of rumblings, especially for class twos, which are co-ops and condos, um, with a larger with larger amounts of, of residents, um, the rates are very high. Um, just University Towers itself is seeing a twenty percent increase in real estate taxes. So I'm not quite sure how that's translating across all the constituents in the district. So I'm just putting it out there as a as a heads up. I'm, I'm deal, I've been talking to uh, Crystal Hudson, our council uh, woman, and a couple other uh, Jabari and um, Farah regarding it, and they're familiar with the issue. Um, but I just wanted to put it out there and I'm not sure how much the community board can do, but I'm just just wanted to get it on the record that um, it's an issue. Um, they released the uh, statements in January. Uh, I think a lot of the co-ops and condoms are just starting to get them now. So it may take a while for the <laughs> for the effect to be felt and people to realize what's happening, um, but it's out there. And uh, just at University Towers, they've increased our assessed value by almost 50%, which is resulting in a, about a 20% um, increase in real estate. Uh, taxes effective uh, July 1. Um, it's phased in over five years. Um, and as you guys are probably aware, it's based on rental income, I mean, rentals, comparable rentals around. Um, there's been a lot of debate about reform and uh, the commission that was created to do reform. So I'm not sure how much the community board is involved in it and if it should be and if it could fall under housing, the committee, but just wanted to put it out there as something that, um, especially it's co-op and condo residents 
um, may uh, be. So, so Doug, thank you for that. Um, we, we are not, what I would say, close to that um, topic, but you know, th that information is helpful for us to keep an ear out and the office will, will work to, you know, make sure we stay abreast of anything, but you clearly have begun the right engagement with Senator Brisport and uh, Council Member Hudson. So um, we'll continue to keep our ears um, posted to that. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, honey. Sure. Um, did I see someone else in the community with their hands up? Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to just move forward with the agenda, but as is our custom, and I know many times we have representatives from our uh, city statewide elected officials here, but I wanted to make sure that, um, and Douglas, you should pay attention to the, to the chat. I think there's some support in the chat for, for the topic you just raised. But with that, I do wanna acknowledge uh, Senator Jabari Brisport, who's here, and it looks like he's in his office because we we seen that fine red chair that's in the background. And so, uh, Senator Brisport, I wanted to welcome you to Community Board too. Thank you for your in participation in person, and wanted to turn the floor over to you for some comments uh, this evening. Uh, amazing. Thank thank you, Chairman uh, Singletary. Um, so uh, greetings from Albany, everyone. I have a few updates. Um, I know it's a packed schedule, so I'll try to keep them brief. I'm going to share my screen very quickly um share, no sorry slideshow uh so uh first things first so the remote meetings um allowance that allows us to do these community board meetings um digitally uh i, I think i told this community board last month but you know back in the fall we sort of stopped putting a, an end date on when remote meetings were allowed and we just gave authority to the governor and and said that whenever she decides that the the COVID state of emergency is over that's when the allowance for remote meetings will, will be will be over. So it's, it's she keeps extending it. So it's currently extended until March 1st. So just a heads up that that deadline is coming up and you know she may extend it again, um, but I wanted to give you that information. Redistricting, we voted in new lines uh, for state legislature, uh, assembly and Senate and also congressional seats. If you haven't been on this site, newyork.redistrictingandu.org, it's very nice. It's not a it's not a government site. It's I think it was created by uh, volunteers from CUNY, but it uses the data and um, it's pretty accurate. So if I just go over to the community board two area, you can see um, the current congressional lines and what they're being changed to. So some of you may be switching from um, Congressman Jeffries to Congresswoman Velasquez. Um, assembly, you can see what the lines currently are and what they are shifting to. And um, for state Senate, for those who have me, um, you can see what the lines are shifting to. So some of you actually may be shifting over from me to either Senator Gennardis or Senator um, Savino, especially in like the downtown uh, Brooklyn area. Um, so, sorry, I'm not stop sharing. Um, so in addition to redistricting, just give me an update about the New York State budget. We are currently in budget season where we're negotiating uh, New York's uh, $216 billion budget. That is due April 1st, but I just wanted to give you um, some just a heads up about things that are relevant to people on this call. One of the things that we do while negotiating the budget is that individual members submit what are known as budget priority letters where we advocate for big ticket items we wanna see in the budget, but we also advocate for small community groups, small nonprofits that do good work in our district. So um, the deadline for all legislators, assembly and Senate to submit um, our budget priority letters to leadership is next week on the 17th. My office is accepting any funding request letters from you know, your organization through uh, the end of Sunday this week. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you've never done this before, um, uh, we made just a quick little page on our site that contains uh, an FAQ about what exactly the budget is, you know, who can apply for state funds, how, how you apply. And again, if you've never done this before, um, we made just like a sample letter of what it would look like to just submit a, a funding request for um, your organization. So um, that being said, I think, sorry, I just can't get back to the, there we go. Um, okay, yeah, that's, that would be it. So yeah, if you have any questions, uh, this is my email address, brisport at nysenate.gov. And if you wanna get on our email list for updates, bit.ly slash sd25 dash updates. 
and I'll just I'll share a link to this slide deck in the chat. Um, and that is uh, that's it. Thank you, Senator Brisport. Um, we appreciate, like I said, your participation in person. I, I do want to just take a minute to share that there is a collection of community boards in Brooklyn, and we have um, convened to try to get um, in support of your efforts to get Albany and, and particularly the executive branch to really reconsider uh, the guidelines for uh, in-person meetings related to the community board. Um, our office has done some research, and I think others have as well, where they have um, seen that there's a greater participation when individuals can participate from wherever they are at the time of the meeting, as opposed to the effort it takes to you know, get to a location and meet in person. And while I'm hopeful that from a health perspective, we're able to turn the corner um, related to the, the pandemic, it, I, I do think from a community and from a participation perspective, this format, even if it's somewhat of a hybrid, I think it allows for greater participation. And so just wanted to share that with you as you continue to advocate for a, a hybrid or at least a virtual participation from community boards. Okay, definitely. Thank you. Um, so since we do have the, the Senator here, Senator, are you available to stick around for maybe three questions from board members? Yeah, of course. So if uh, any, any board members have any questions, you're gonna, you're gonna limit it to three, but if you have any questions, if you would raise your hand um, virtually, that would be great. Uh, Mr. Duke? Good evening, uh, Senator Brisport. Uh, this is John Du. There is a, uh, you, you mentioned the taxes. There is a great disparity in the tax rate that uh, is applied to a lot of these large new developments. These high rise developments are taxed at a very strangely low rate. Is there any discussion of uh, uh, developing some level of equality with that? Yes, um, I, I believe what you're referring to is what we call the uh, the 421A tax abatement, which is expiring at the end of this year. Um, the, the governor proposed, um, the new governor proposed her own uh, amended version of it, which I think a lot of people in legislature are not enthusiastic about, myself included. I, I think it still heavily subsidizes non-affordable housing. Um, so there, there absolutely is discussion on finding something much more equitable. Thank you for that. Mr. Flannoy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Senator Brispoint, I was kind of curious in regards to what was going on with the cantilever. Okay, on the brook, uh, the... Yes, uh, if you can give us an update, if you know if anything is going on with that. I, unfortunately, I do not have an update, but if you give me your email address, I will, I will get an update and send it to you, Bill. Okay, thank you, Senator. Senator Brisbane, as always, thank you so much and uh, have a good evening. You, you're welcome to stay, but I, you may have a conflict, so I'll let you continue to manage your schedule. <laughs> I'm to get to another another community board, but um, you know, I, I put the link in the chat. I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, and if anybody wants to visit Albany, let me. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice we'll take you up on that offer, depending on how the future looks like. <laughs> <laughs> have a nice day, everyone. You too. Have a good evening. Thank you. Um. Tay, I may need your help. I'm not aware that I see any other electeds in person. I see some representatives, which we'll come to later, but I don't see any other electeds in person. Not at this time. Okay, great. So we'll move forward to agenda item number five, uh, Committees for Action. It's the Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. My name is Brandon Smith. My co-chair co is Nicole McKnight. I'm really excited to be here and present to you the liquor licenses we approved at our last meeting. Last Wednesday, February 2nd, we had a great meeting. We had a presentation on sanitation and on uh, uh, composting, and uh, we'll give our report in full at the executive later this month. But there were four new liquor licenses we approved, and I'll run through an overview of them really quick so that you have a, a sense about um, each of the circumstances. Uh, they were all approved unanimously. Um, first is uh, Esprit Sushi. 
It's a sushi place on Atlantic Avenue, 177 Atlantic between uh, 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 Court and Clinton. Uh, the hours are gonna be noon to 11 p.m. every day. They're gonna open in two weeks. The, uh, they're gonna hire locally and it, there is gonna ultimately be outdoor seating, but it wasn't, uh, they're, they're not applying for it yet. So that wasn't something that we approved at, at this time. So it's a indoor only 12 p.m. to 11 p.m. every day. Um, second location, 472 Myrtle Avenue, Lula May. Um, this, this location was previously known as Via Pancho Taqueria, a uh, Mexican place, and it's going to be a, um, it, it's going to be an American Southwest Asian type of restaurant. Uh, they're going to be open from 12 p.m. to midnight, Sunday to Wednesday, uh, 12 p.m. to 2 a.m., Thursday to Saturday. Uh, there is one resident upstairs and they actually wrote a letter of support for the application. Uh, they have some seasonal outdoor seating that they're gonna have in the warmer weather from uh, 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. They have not received any complaints. Uh, we voted to support them uh, 800. And I didn't tell you the vote last time is also 800. Third place was 87 South Elliott Place Island Shack. This is going to be a small Caribbean restaurant located in Fort Greene um, near the area where uh, you may remember uh, Smoke Joint is over there. Um, it's The hours are going to be 12 noon to 1130 p.m. every day. They don't have any outdoor space where they can put seating, so there's no outdoor seating at this place. Um, they're uh, planning to hire locally and are going to consider Fort Green Snap uh, in, in terms of their staffing, no issues with neighbors. We voted to support them 800. Fourth and final place is called Clover Hill, located 20 Columbia Place in uh, Brooklyn Heights. This place is going to be a um, small establishment. Um, the uh, uh, hours are going to be extremely limited, actually, only 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Sunday and Monday, and then 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Tuesday to Saturday. Uh, there's no outdoor seating. Uh, they're going to hold a few private events like dinners, but nothing past 10 p.m. Uh, we voted to support them also 800. There were also no issues with any of the renewals, um, and we voted to support them as well. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, any questions, Mr. Cyril? Cyril Scala, you're on mute. Hi, Brandon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brandon, you know, you and I have been emailing each other about these new, the rising smoke shops that have been popping up in some of the areas of CB2. And I've been doing some information, trying to gather some information about them. Um, have you, has your committee or have you um, delved into this situation? Basically what I'm, I'm interested in is, do they have, uh, is there a licensing issue? How do they manage the store? What are the hours? Are they supposed to be certain, to, um, um, are they supposed to separate from, from schools? Things like that. I'm not sure about the law. I know it's going into existence. I don't know what they will be doing. And I was wondering what, if you've done some investigation. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Scala. Mr. Singletary, do, do you want me to answer Mr. Scala's question or do you want me to, do you want to address it at a different point in the meeting? I just know it, it, doesn't, it doesn't concern my report. Yeah, so because it doesn't concern the report, let's hold that. Um, and then Mr. Scala, if you're okay with that, can we follow up after we deal with the items that are being listed, perhaps maybe in other business? I apologize. I'm sorry. No, yes, no, no need to apologize. That's not. That's let's not, do that. Perfect. That's fine. Thank right. you. That's perfect. No need to apologize. That's perfect. Um, Ms. Barbara Zollegren. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, judging by the, the map that was on there in terms of Esprit Sushi, is that replacing Matushi? 
You know, I, I think yes. we. Yes. Okay. Well, Thank you. I, I thought I was going to say, I think we addressed that question at the committee, and yes, it is. Thanks. All right. All right. Was that your only question, Barbara? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. And with that, I'll entertain a motion to accept the committee's recommendation. So moved. Mr. Meyer, second. Uh, Ms. Gelman, is there um, any discussion on the motion? John, do. I Mr. will Duke. vote in favor of the motion, but for full disclosure, I am co chair of the Myrtle Avenue Business Improvement District. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, either raise your hand or indicate by aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Please follow in the same format. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Welcome. Uh, next item this evening uh, for action is land use. I'll turn it over to the chair for land use. Welcome, Chair Lenny. This is Carlton Gordon and Irene Jenner and Dr. Kostafin are our co-chairs. Uh, Dr. did a wonderful job on uh, taking minutes uh, for this matter uh, that we're going to have and for the uh, other matters that we had at our last meeting. Okay, what we have here is a ULERP uh changing of course the use of a particular piece of property and this one is a ULEP. i'll give you the numbers if anybody cares 200-335-ZMK and 200-336-CRK uh it's basically uh, a property at 98 third avenue also known as 300 Bergen Street. And so we're at Third and Bergen. Some of you may already know it as the Shell gas station that's going to be torn down and replaced by this uh, new building that you see in the, uh, for those who have the visuals, you can see that we have here. Uh, it'll be a eight story uh, building with uh, what I was trying to say is that we have it will have ground floor will be uh, uh, will be stores uh, retail <laughs> and the rest 24 units will be residential units uh, it will be of those units 17 of those units will be one bedrooms and eight will be two bedrooms it will be a 28,000 square feet uh, again, with 24 dwelling units of that. And the request is also as part of the change. The change is going to go from the current gas station manufacturing M12 to what to be an R residential 7D slash C2, which is for the commercials. So we're covering both the residential and commercials. Uh, there'll be also uh, mandatory inclusionary housing as a part of it as well. Uh, so the people who have modest means will have a shot at getting some of those apartments as well. Uh, it'll be six units of the 24 will be uh, the MIH units. Of those six, four, it'll be four one bedroom units and two, uh, two bedroom units. Uh, those of uh, CB2 residents uh, will have, a, when, it, when the opportunities come for application, CB2 residents will be given a priority uh, as part of the application process. Uh, the, the commercial units will be, as you can see, it will be along the Bergen Street side of the property. And one of the things that was praised by Howard Collins of the Borham Hill Association was that this will help uh, Borham Hill residents to have a more uh, retail, access to retail, which at that point, when you get towards Third Avenue, Fourth Avenue, uh, going towards, you know, maybe towards the Barclays, the retail kind of, I don't say peters out, but it gets a little bit lessened. So this will be an opportunity for people in 
the more eastern part of Boreham Hill to have more access to more up-to-date retail. Uh, one of the things that we pointed out is that the current property is a Shell gas station that's going to be gone or un under the application. However, uh, because it's a gas station dealing with petroleum products, there'll have to be remediation. Uh, they'll have to clean out any leaks. I think they even acknowledged that there were leaks uh, you know, from the fuel. They've been cleaning, working on keeping that for getting worse. But for them to get the permits, they must uh, show that there's remediation. So that that's going to be their top priority once they get before they can get you know move along and get any further approvals. Um, we like the design, design of the of the building itself. As you saw from the pictures, it'll be a brick and glass uh, facades with a little bit of a setback in the back, uh, not in the back, but at towards the top which will be accessed by all tenants. And the tenants will have a little space that they can, you know, for, to go out and get a little bit of fresh air in the, you know, while on the premises. Uh, we liked it and we approved the application, seven yes, one no, and two abstentions. Uh, and we asked for your approval for this particular uh, application at 98 Third Avenue, also known as 300 Bergen Street. Thank you, Mr. Gordon, for that report. Are there any questions for Mr. Gordon? Uh, Emily? I see, I guess, Cyril, you have a question? Cyril, was ahead, Cyril was ahead of me, so I'm, I'm okay to wait until after him. It's okay. quite all right. Yeah, I, did, I was looking at the URL. I I oh, 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 I'm sorry. I appreciate that. But oh, sorry. I'm this. Sorry. I appreciate that. I love all the hospitality. We're all one family. I'm giving a big hug. <laughs> Emily. We are so polite tonight. I love it. Um, so apologies. Um, so just, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you said this, but I just want to ensure, um, obviously I know that the city has banned the practice of separate entrances around welcome housing, but it did, did it feel that everything was truly equitable regardless of whether it appears so. Yeah. There isn't any, what they used to call the poor door. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, everybody goes in and it's not particularly big property. So I don't think you can set up a separate entrance or anything like that anyway. It'll just be, and, and like I said, it will be, uh, the, the ground floor is going to be mainly commercial. So it's, you know, a lot of the space is going to be taken up by commercial, which is really of and it, which is desired so and i think that you just couldn't fit in a poor door in that particular instance and as i and i did point out that they all the tenants will have access to the you know this is a small recreation you know actually you know it's getting some air basically they'll go up a few flights and there's a little open setback area where you can you know walk out i guess it can you know you could sit on the bench have a sandwich or something, get a little fresh air, sit in the rain if you want to, just to uh, relax. And all the tenants will have access to that. Thank you for that, thank you. Okay, I see Ciro next. Gordon, thank you, Gordon. I, I just had a question, a, a point of order. Basically, you approved it. You mentioned the fact that they, had, they have to remediate the, uh, the land because of the oil leak. Would you right. approve it? Pending that approval, or I don't know, maybe maybe the community doesn't have that. I think we have to, uh, well, the way the the way this uh, it's set up is that we have to give our approval, but we can certainly state that, and they know they have to get it anyway. They can't. But did you state they can't go in any your further approval? without the? Um, yeah, they can't go any further without getting uh, approvals for the remediation. But we have to still give our approval as well uh, as to the pending, overall pending program. The but to the, uh, your motion would be pending. You would approve it pending that uh, uh, remediation, no. or you just approving it. I don't. I don't understand that. That's the only part I was wondering. Mr. Gordon, may I jump in for a sec? It's Daughtry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just want to clarify that um, that the remediation is required by OER, 
and OER, Office of Environmental Remediation, is tied to their ability to get permits to build the building. So I'm say, I think that I can fairly say the committee felt like that oversight was being taken care of by OER. But basically you could have you could have added that if you wanted to. I would say that would have been redundant just because the agency is already monitoring the spill and the cleanup. Ms. Five and they can't and they can't proceed to do anything with the building if they don't show that they have been successful in the remediation efforts. So even if we let's say we approve it and for whatever reason they do an awful job on the remediation. They're not going to get the permits. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I speak also? Yes. Uh, no, wait, yes, wait, stop, stop, stop. I got this. Relax. Hmm? I call the Congress first, and then Bill, I'll come up to you. Raise your hand for me, unless you have something you want to add okay. on a particular topic. You have something you want to add in addition to what Dorothy put out? Yes, sir. Okay, Ms. Fibers, let me let Mr. Flanoy add some comments, please. Okay. Uh, I specifically asked, I actually read the report on this, and I specifically asked that they had, had actually had begun doing the drilling for the uh, exploration of how far the actual spill had gone. And he said he was in the process of it, and he was aware that he needed to take care of the remediation before they could go forward. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Ms. Feibush? Thank you. I'd like to know if there was any discussion about the possibility of solar panels on the roof or other type of green roof um, design or structure for the environment. I don't recall if there was a, a discussion of a green roof. Uh, again, part of the, if I recall in the design, part of the area will, they'll have some kind of, um, I guess, greenery, if you want to call it as part of their little recreation area for the tenants as a whole, but um, nothing specific upon green roofs or so, and, and I don't think they're, it's, it's solar. Although it, at eight stories, I don't know, it, maybe they could do it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next, I'm gonna call on a public member um, and her name is uh, Nicole Murray, Miss Murray. Hi, if it's a matter of public record, who voted no and was there a reason given? I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Usually no, I just concentrate on the actual numbers. Yeah, oftentimes you don't know why a person votes the way they do unless they um, decide that the votes are on their own. I voted no. Was there a reason? I don't, reason? Know, you want to take time to, I don't know, Mr. Singletary. I mean, it's, is it's this not, normal? It's not a protocol requirement. I mean, okay, it, and it's not really necessary. All right, it's fine. Thank you. Um, the blonde voted no. I'm glad you reminded me, Esther. And then two people abstained. I don't remember which two. And um, I'm going to call on. And please, please correct me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. But uh, Saruthi. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a concern slash question. So the Shell gas station is honestly one of the um, um, two gas stations in the downtown Brooklyn area, the other one being mobile. So if that gas station is going to be torn down, then we only basically have one, which is the mobile that's located on Flatbush. So is that a, con did that, was that discussed or is there another gas station being built? Um, oh, it's just a concern that I have as a uh, as someone who owns an automobile. You know, I'm aware of that. It, it, the mobile on uh, Flatbush Avenue extension will be the last one, probably, in this area. The applicant, the being the person push, you know, asking for the change, simply said that they couldn't have that the the Shell gas station is not making money. It's not profitable for them to continue. And that's why he's asking for the, you know, one, I guess, I guess, say motivations to try to make the change. Uh, it's the business is just not making a profit. So, you know, we can't force them to continue in uh, 
to continue having the shell get you know a gas station there if they're not if the, if the business is not you know profitable and this is something that uh, we're asking for i guess yes six new mandatory inclusionary housing units which is helpful and the we're also be getting a uh, i guess you know again a retail which will be useful at that location uh so it's it's a trade-off, uh, if but we can't force them to continue to pr provide uh, pump the gas if they're <laughs> not a uh, profitable institution. Of course, thank thank you for the clarification. I I presumed as much. I just wanted to ask. Yeah, um, Mr. Collins from the community. Yeah, hi. Thank you for your time. Uh, I wanted to point out that there's a gas station three blocks south of this location and there's more on fourth avenue that mobile station on flatbush is really expensive but there are other alternatives uh, even further down south it is a concern uh maybe not as big as the loss of supermarkets uh in answer to what betty's question is page 13 of the presentation deck lists sustainability features i don't know how much of a green roof they could do but on that page there are low, low flow plumbing fixtures, LED lights, energy saving appliances, efficient heating and cooling. And it says green roof and solar panels, although I don't see them on the, on the um, ground plans uh, for, the, for the building. And again, the BHA, the board likes this building, thinks it's contextual with the other buildings across the street. We are, um, We'd like to hear from the developer that this is actually the building that they're going to build and no no offense to this group that's been very forthright but other people uh, put up big concept drawings and then change the materiality uh, the look of this building the materiality the the choices that they make with the brick colors are all very important to the happy outcome the welcoming we we would like to give to this building and the only other issue we have is the uh, zoning that applies to the uh, part of this, the street front, frontage on third that this, um, this development doesn't address. So there's a little bit of concern about what happens to the rest of the frontage on third Avenue. Thank you. So um, with that, I'm going to Mr. Meyer. Motion to approve. Second. Anyone want to second the motion? Sir. I'll second. Mr. Quint, uh, thank you. Um, any, dis any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your, raise your hand or indicate aye. Aye. Don't, aye. We, need a, don't we need a, a roll call for ULARP? We do, but as long as we count abstentions and opposition, we'll have the numbers. Actually, you know what? Um, I'm sorry, my mistake. I didn't. I missed the fact that it is a Ulip. Let's 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 stick. Let's be consistent with our protocol. Okay. So, um, I'll read them out. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Um Janner. All right. Go in alphabetical order. So get ready to unmute yourselves. Ms. Ali, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Anadu. Yes. Ms. Blount. No. Ms. Karstarfin. Yes. Ms. Chang. Yes. Ms. Cobb. Akosua. Okay, we'll come back. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Yes. Oh, got you, Akosua. Thanks. Uh -huh. Mr. Cohen, how do you vote? We'll come back. Ms. Cumberbatch. Abstain. Mr. Uh, Dew. This is Mr. Cohen. I, uh, I vote yes. OK, thanks, Ron. Yes. 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 Thanks, John. Uh, Ms. Einhorn. Yes. Ms. Fybush. Yes. Mr. Ferreira. Yes. Mr. Flanoy. Vote with the committee. Yes. Ms. Gelbs. Yes. Ms. Gilman. Yes. Mr. Gordon. Yes. 
Carlton? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Howell. Yes. Ms. Hubbard coming and weary. Yes. Ms. Janner. Yes. Ms. Johnson. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Sam. Mr. Lastowecki. Yes. Ms. McKnight. Yes. Mr. Meyer. Yes. Ms. Morales. Yes. Ms. Masso. Yes. Ms. Policia. Yes. Ms. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Quint. Yes. yes. Ms. Quint. Yes. Uh, Ms. Richardson. Yes. Mr. Scala. Yes. Mr. Smith. Brandon. Yes. Ms. Thompson Manning. Yes. Ms. Thurston. Yes. Ms. Yearwood Young. Yes. Ms. Ayla Granger. Yes. Before I go to Lenny, did I miss anyone who's here? Yes. Hi, Victor. How do you vote? Yes. Perfect. All right, Mr. Singletary? Yes. Perfect. The vote passes 36 to 1 to 1. Thank you, everyone. Um, as far as the chair's report, I don't have one this evening. So that concludes agenda item number six. Um, at this time, I want to call on, uh, under category number seven, elected officials and dignitaries, I want to call on uh, Council Member Lincoln Ressler. Uh, it's good to join you as always, Chair Singletary, and good to be home at CB2. Uh, thank you all for having me. I just wanted to share a few quick updates. Uh, I've really enjoyed the partnership we've already been developing between our office and CB2, so thank you all. Uh, firstly, uh, I think I'm sure, like just about all of you, I was outraged and blindsided by the Con Ed bills we received this month. Many of our neighbors received doubling and tripling of their bills, and you know, it, I just, on the heels of this pandemic, working people cannot manage multi-hundred dollar increases out of the blue. Uh, so yesterday I organized a letter from all of our Brooklyn council members uh, and our borough president. And I sent that up to the public service commission um, calling on them to investigate and to bring some real accountability. Uh, we are going to keep on the PSC and, and push uh, to try to make sure that um, they can help us smooth over these bills uh, and, and that we don't experience these wild sustained increases that are just not, um, not manageable. Um, secondly, uh, we are really excited that, uh, as you all know, the community board application process is open now. We're gonna be hosting a forum on February 23rd as a kind of community board 101. If you've ever thought about joining a community board, we wanted to set up a Zoom where you could come and learn from the experts. Uh, and we have uh, representatives from the four community boards in our district joining us, the, the district manager from CB6, the chair of CB3, the transportation chair from CB1, and here and from CB2, our distinguished secretary, Jessica, is going to be on the panel. Um, yeah, Jessica. Um, so that should be fun. If, if you have any friends that have thought about joining or applying to the board, join us and get a chance to ask questions. You all know what it's about, but uh, the members of CB2 obviously know what it's all about, but we'd love to have your input. Um, one other big announcement that we wanted to share is that tomorrow uh, we are hosting a job fair just outside of CB2 by a block and a half. Um, uh, as, as you all know well, thanks to the uh, great work of uh, Brandon and others from CB2 uh, in the, um, uh, community town hall that you hosted about the new shelter coming to one uh, Hoyt Street. Um, we are hosting a job fair with a PCI. We got our the shelter operator to agree to come and meet with NYCHA residents in our community to consider them for job openings at the shelter prior to anyone else being able to apply. So tomorrow from 10 to one, we're gonna be at the Wyckoff Gardens Community Center at 280, uh, 280 Wyckoff. And from three to six, we're gonna be at the Gowanus Community Center uh, APCI is hiring for over 100 jobs, and we really want to make sure that this is a model for every new employer coming to the downtown Brooklyn community and coming across District 33, that when they want to, uh, we want them to, to come and open in our community, but we also want them to hire locally and especially prioritize low-income neighbors who have not benefited from all of the growth and, um, 
and wealth that's that's you know become concentrated in our area, uh, especially our, our our residents of of public housing. So that's a big priority, and then. I'm foreshadowing a little bit here. Uh, we're, we're still finalizing the details, but I did want to share with this group that in, cel in celebration of Black History Month, we're going to be doing a walk-in tour of downtown Brooklyn uh, with one of our favorite activists uh, uh, from the community on February 26th about the history of downtown Brooklyn, which as many of you know, um, you know, was the epicenter of the Black community, was the gateway into Brooklyn for the Black community for, okay. uh, for many. Um, uh, you know, generations ago, uh, many of our great black churches started in downtown Brooklyn and, and moved out to other neighborhoods. Uh, it was made many stops on the Underground Railroad. So we're going to be highlighting the history of downtown Brooklyn and the struggles that we're facing today over gentrification. Um, and we thought that that would be a, a meaningful way to kind of engage in Black History Month from a neighborhood perspective, um, to engage in our, our local black history in the district and the struggles that we're continuing to face today. So we'll be sending out uh, information on that on social media and in emails. Um, there is so much more going on. Um, we, I, was, I was at Rikers today. Um, I'm on, serving on the criminal justice committee and we need to bring some real oversight to the humanitarian crisis that we are facing there. And also make sure that uh, we don't uh, bring the dumpster fire that is Rikers Island uh, to our new borough-based jails. Uh, so those are big priorities of mine. There's there's much more to talk about and to do, um, but uh, we are off to, we're having a lot of fun and uh, we're trying to be everywhere we can around the district and try to be a resource. We're doing council member on your corner in North Brooklyn this weekend in, in McCarran Park, but we'll be over at the Borough, Paul, Borough Hall Farmers Market for a council member on your corner soon in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we're just looking forward to trying to help each and every member of the community every way we possibly can. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, Chair Singletary, happy to take questions. If you have time on the agenda, defer to whatever you might allow. Sure, are you available for three questions? Deal. Okay. Um, well, Not if, if it's John Do, I feel like that should count as two. <laughs> well, well we, won't, we won't disappoint you, so John Do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Lincoln. Um, <laughs> a couple of items. Uh, 10 years after downtown Brooklyn was up zone, we got our first ULERP. We have not gotten any of the community benefits that were agreed to when we did the up zoning. I won't talk about all of the uh, ADA access to all of the subway stations, none of which have happened. The underground parking garage that was supposed to accommodate all of the agency vehicles that are parked on the sidewalks of the different public buildings downtown Brooklyn. Uh, we don't now have a current solution for that since the underground parking under uh, the Duffield Street Park was taken out of the plan. Uh, we have been asking city planning to come out and do a study of the impact of the upzoning because all of the folk from downtown Brooklyn, which was a low income community of color have been removed and the homeless population is as high as it's ever been in the city. None of the affordable housing accommodates the folk in the community. How can we begin to address that? Uh, John, you, were, I, you articulated exactly how I feel. And I am angry about it. I'm, you know, when when they came to this community board 16, 17 years ago, whatever it is now, um, they promised us the third major economic development hub, commercial hub of New York City. And Absolutely. it is in the year 2022 that the first commercial office building is actually getting built. It is Thank all you. of the development that we have dealt with in downtown Brooklyn has been luxury residential housing. I think close to high 80% of the high 80s, close to 90% of the units built have been luxury market rate housing, overwhelmingly studios and one bedrooms, not geared toward the families we need. And then of the quote unquote affordable housing, more than a quarter of it is at 130% area mean and income. So we're talking about a one bedroom apartment for some somebody making $108,000 a year, right? That's not affordable housing. So I am angry about the development that we've experienced. It has failed to meet our needs. It has not been the, the job creation and the economic hub that we were promised. And as you know, most importantly, the very limited community benefits that we were promised, and let's be real, they were very limited. The tiny little Willoughby Square Park, the new school, we still haven't experienced any of them, right? And it's all these years later. And you know, I 
coming into this term, you know, I felt like across this whole district from downtown Brooklyn to the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront and with the new Gowanus rezoning, my number one priority is to fix, is to make sure that we get this administration to follow through on the promises of the previous rezoning. And so, you know, the school is slated to open in 2023. And I've been in touch with our District 13 superintendent on what the admissions policies will be so we can ensure that it's an integrated and diverse and equitable school. The Willoughby Square Park, as Community Board 2 knows well, and Lenny's been a tremendous partner here, um, as always, you know, we want to move forward as quickly as we can on this park. Um, they inexplicably put a dog run on top of where we know the Underground Railroad used to stand. Um, so we're pushing EDC to not, you know, in my opinion, EDC how do I say this politely on a community board hearing? EDC did, you know, um, poop the bed uh, waiting 17 years on this park, right? So I'm pissed at EDC for their mishandling of this. And I, I, my message has been, we need the dog run, we need the park, and we, we cannot afford any further delay. Um, and, you know, so, you know, what we've experienced in downtown Brooklyn is a series of buildings get getting placed into a neighborhood without any neighborhood planning. And so, you know, I'm, you know, I think that some of what the downtown Brooklyn partnership put forward last year around um, protected bike lanes, uh, uh, rationalizing the bus train, you know, kind of bus network in downtown Brooklyn, um, more pedestrian space, those could be some positive developments. And we need to, um, we need to do so much more because you're right that we've lost um, many, great small businesses that were run by uh, people of color, many longtime uh, residents um, that were low-income people of color, they're all, they're mostly gone. And um, so, you know, and one of them is on this call, Maisha Morales did more great organizing um, to fight back against what we knew this, what we knew was going to happen uh, than just about anybody. And so, um, you know, the work, the it's a frustrating situation, but we're going to continue to push through to see that the promises that were made are ultimately kept. Um, I wish I I wish I could I had a, a more uplifting statement. Thank you for that, Lincoln. And the uh, one Hoyt Street versus the eleven Hoyt Street condos. That's going to be a very interesting juxtaposition because those condos are going for two million dollars, and it's going to be adjacent to a very working class type of environment. Yeah, you know, I've been actively involved in working on this. And recently we convened a meeting uh, with the community board, the 84th precinct, the downtown Brooklyn partnership, APCI, um, to make sure that all of the rel and breaking ground, you know, that does the homeless outreach in the area, to make sure that each of the groups in the area that are responsible for public safety and public, you know, are working together and are coordinated. And I'm committed to getting a community advisory board off the ground prior to the shelter opening, so that all of that everyone in the neighborhood knows there's a one eight there's a number you can call twenty four seven to get assistance if there's any issues that we we have one of, we have the phone numbers of the staff at at the the shelter at One Hoyt, so that we're in close communication and coordination because we got to work together to to um, I think I hope welcome these new folks into our neighborhood and and we need a PCI to run a shelter that demonstrates that they want, they're gonna be a good neighbor to all of us and to the downtown Brooklyn community. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my best to bring a compassionate orientation uh, to this new uh, proposal, to this new site, and but we've got to hold them to a high standard. And so I'm gonna be meeting with the DSS commissioner that oversees DHS soon. And I'm not sure if I'm gonna be successful, but my push is that we should be doing more street outreach work in downtown Brooklyn. It is the area where the highest concentration of, of chronically street homeless people are in all of Brooklyn. And we should be doing more to help those folks connect to services, connect to support, connect to housing, most of all. Um, because once the new shelter opens, the APCI is going to get blamed for everything, right? Okay. And even the status quo that wasn't their fault. So, uh, you know, we should be doing more to, to bring a, to do more to help the people that are already there that, that need our assistance. Ms. Morales? Already hard, Mr. Mr. Rassel. Thank you. I'm having fun. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, hello, Lincoln. Hey, and Maisha. I, I, as, as you mentioned uh, way back when, feels like yesterday, but it's been over 10 years. 
when I was one of the small businesses who led that fight uh, against the displacement, 2004 rezoning and the displacement of small businesses. Now that you're in office and, and you were with us for many years, working around those issues. So thank you for your support. Uh, now that you're a council member, are there any maybe like conversations happening around how do we preserve whatever small businesses are left, especially minority owned businesses. And it seems like there's probably a little more along like Livingston and how we can possibly create more. Because if you look at Fulton Street overall, it's a shopping desert, right? It, if you look at it, there's shuttered uh, businesses and you can blame the pandemic, but that was happening even before the pandemic. And just wondering if your office is, is thinking about that specifically. And if you are, I would love to, if you could, would accept the uh, community support around that. There's actually a plan that we had done a study with Pratt Area Community Council around, uh, not Pratt Area Community Council. Sorry. Pratt, Insti uh, Pratt, Pratt Institute. Uh, Center for Community Development. I got you. Right. Um, you, uh, in reference to using those second floor empty spaces along Fulton Street and turning them into uh, almost like little mini malls, affordable spaces mm -hmm. for small businesses. And if that's something you're open, th open to, I can share that with you. I would love to, you know, I've, I feel like that's been a dream for all of us for for a long time to activate those second those beautiful second floor spaces on Fulton Mall. I know that the downtown Brooklyn partnership and others have looked at it and you know it's and talked to landlords and that there are challenges, but I would love to think with to look at that report and to think with you together how do we get the incentives in place to make it happen because it's great under it's great space that's totally underutilized mostly used for storage and it should be you know, contributing to a dynamic economic hub. Um, so I would love to review that with you and think about ways we can help. And I, your, you know, your point's well taken also that there are still a number of, you know, great old businesses on Livingston, um, especially a couple on Skirmerhorn, um, even a couple in, on Fulton. And we've got to make sure that we sustain them and support them. And so uh, Arvind is on here from my team, uh, who's terrific and is our point for the area. And you know, we've been so far focusing a lot of our small business work on Montague and Atlantic, but I think you're right that we should be focusing on downtown Brooklyn uh, as well. Um, and I should say, as we're talking all about downtown Brooklyn, I, um, I this earlier this, I guess it was last week, I did something called the Skirmerhorn Challenge, which was to uh, try to bike down Skirmerhorn while staying in the bike lane uh, without exiting it. And it took over 40 minutes to go five blocks because that bike lane is one of the most um, unsafe, uh, congested bike lanes in the city. Uh, and I don't, uh, you know, and, and it's a priority of mine to push DOT to get that thing fixed. Um, but very much on the small businesses, but just want to mention the Skirmerhorn piece as well. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilmember Ressler. Appreciate you participating and look forward to working with you and seeing you in the future. If you would, could you just um, have someone from your office put in the date and time of the uh, Community War 101 session at your home? Yes, it's February 23rd, 6.30, 7.30. Um, we'll add the link in there. I think Arvin snuck it in at some point, but we'll add it again. Okay. And it's featuring the amazing Jessica Thurston. So who wouldn't want to be there? Uh, thank you. Have a good one, guys. Thank you so much. You too. Be well. Um, at this time, I'd like to call on uh, Allison Mingus, representing... Uh, Assembly member Joanne Simon. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison. I'm Assembly member Simon's new community liaison. Uh, last month was my first time at this community board meeting. Um, so I have a couple updates from Albany. Um, it's very busy. She's been up there for three or four days a week for the past few weeks. Um, the assembly member's dyslexia screening bill passed. Um, it's a screening bill for incarcerated individuals. Um, it passed the assembly and she's hoping that it's going to pass the Senate. Um, and she's also working on another screening bill for younger people. Um, so right now the legislature is in the midst of budget hearings. Um, and so she's been focusing a lot of her questions on improving literacy. 
She's also brought up concerns regarding improving access to the Department of Labor. Um, that's been a huge issue for so many of our constituents. Um, and she also is asking questions to ensure that the big employers are paying into unemployment. Um, and then I'm sure another thing on people's minds is redistricting. Um, that's been huge, as I'm sure many of you know about. Um, so we just wanna let people know that for Assembly District 52, she'll be losing some parts of South Park Slope, but retaining a lot of North Park Slope. And, you know, she, we're not gonna weigh in on the other district lines. Um, and if anybody has any more questions about redistricting or other things happening in Albany, I'll drop my email in the chat and um, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Allison. Um, next we have Andrew Wright, representing council member Hudson. Hey, good evening, y'all. Um, so yes, I have a few updates from the council member. Great to see uh, so many y'all again. Um, so a few things. So one regarding property taxes, you know, uh, we've had a ton of messages about this. Uh, we're working to schedule a meeting with the Department of Finance to discuss this and going to bring some of our constituents with us so they can firsthand explain their problems and their concerns about their assessments to the Department of Finance. Um, so we'll we'll be in touch about that. Um, second, regarding uh, what Councilmember Ressler mentioned with Con Ed, uh, rate hikes, um, if you have seen your utility bill spike, I know I have, I'm sure all of you have too, uh, you can file a complaint with Con Ed. Um, I'll drop the info in the chat, but for those who uh, are on the phone, the number is 800-342-3377. Once again, that's 800-342-3377. And then we have a few events that our office is hosting in the coming days. Uh, so tomorrow night is our final dis uh, discretionary funding training um, in coordination with the nonprofit help desk. Uh, Council member Ressler's office is also gonna be co-sponsoring it uh, along with a few others. Um, if you're interested in that, I'll drop a, a link in the chat. Um, so any nonprofits who would like to apply but are unsure what to do, uh, that's the perfect place for y'all. Um, second, on this Monday, we're going to have a PPE distribution and COVID-19 testing kit uh, distribution with the borough president. Um, in the morning, it's going to be at Ingersoll Community Center, and then the evening, it's going to be at the CB9 district office. Um, we'll have further information on social media, so make sure to follow the council member if you haven't already. Um, and then finally, we are looking to change the uh, symbols on our on our trash cans. We have some new trash cans in the district, um, and so we're asking folks to weigh in with their idea for the best slogan. Um, so that information, once again, I'll post in the chat, but you can vote for your favorite slogan um, and see something fun on your trash cans. Um, thanks, y'all. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to call on David Lewis, Mayor's Office of um, CAU. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Lewis, Mayor's Office of Community Affairs Unit. Um, I am uh, happy to be here this evening. Just a quick update. Um, I don't know if everyone has had a chance to review the mayor's blueprint to end gun violence, so I'm going to be including it in the chat uh, for you all to review. Um, there have been, there's been another appointment. Also, um, the mayor had appointed last week the new parks commissioner, um, Sue Donahue. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can reach me and I'll put my, my contact information in the, con in, in the uh, chat, but 646-385-0293. Um, I'm happy to help out with any uh, issues that you need addressed. And also um, looking forward to meeting with the uh, community board in person to discuss the needs of the, uh, the district. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, I'm gonna call on Greer Mayhew, Senator Kavanaugh's office. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Grim Mayhew from State Senator Brian Kavanaugh's office. Um, we do have some updates this evening. Um, the first one is that Senator Kavanaugh announced yesterday that his housing access voucher program um, actually advanced through the Senate Housing Committee and is now heading to the Senate Finance Committee. Um, this program, this bill rather, it, uh, establishes a rent assistance program in form of housing vouchers for eligible individuals and families who are homeless and who face imminent loss of housing. The Senator sees obviously like everyone does that uh, homelessness is a, not only a citywide issue but a statewide issue. And he's very delighted that this is the first step um, to getting this much needed piece of legislation forward. Um, and secondly, uh, the New York State Division of Homes and Community Renewal 
um, announced that they will be stopping, stop, will stop taking new applications for um, the homeowners assistance fund starting on February 18th. Just a reminder for folks, this is a federally funded program dedicated to assist, assisting homeowners who are at risk of default foreclosure or displacement as a result of financial hardship caused by COVID-19. Um, and after and starting on February 19th, um, anyone who uh, submits an application will be admitted um, to the waiting list. Um, I will provide a web, uh, the website on to the chat box after I'm done. And lastly, um, I just wanna announce that this is actually my last community board meeting with everyone. Um, I'm transitioning out of the office um, starting next Friday. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much for these last two years. And I look forward and hopefully in another capacity, I'll be able to work with you again. Thanks. So Greer, congratulations. Um, wish you all the best. But before we send you off, I think I have two questions for you. So we want to get to it the community board two way. And of in course. doing so, it wouldn't be a community board meeting if you didn't hear from my good friend, John Dew. So I'm going to call on Mr. Dew. Oh, welcome, Greer. I'm not sure that this question is appropriate for you or any of the electeds, uh, but the city of New York and the Department of Transportation was sued a couple of years ago about ADA compliance with the sidewalks and the city lost the suit and is allocating upwards of a billion and a half dollars to change most of the sidewalks and get them up to ADA compliance. The sidewalks are currently marked with white markings. Is there a way we can get a list of the sidewalks that are going to be replaced in community board too? So um, I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, I can definitely work on getting to see if there is a list. Um, I don't know if anyone else has the answer for that. If you can get it to the board. This, is, this is David. So I can work with DOT to um, compile a list. Um, and so I can work with the district manager to get that information and then share it and then um, can share it out with um, whoever needs to see that. Thank you so much. Not a problem. Lindsay? Hi, I was wondering about the rental assistance uh, funds. I believe that extensions were granted because they weren't being well utilized. And I'm wondering if you can report out about how they're being utilized now that the program is about to sunset. Um, you're talking about the homeowners assistance fund or the, you said rental assistance, so. I'm sorry, I thought you were. I thought you were speaking to their rental assistance program. No, no, mm -mm. Um, ERAP, no. Uh, ERAP, just for everyone's information, e the application is open, but there's no funding for it. Um, so they're just taking applications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Smith? Uh, Mr. Mayhew, I I'd like to raise a question that uh, perhaps my fellow board member, Mr. Scala, might be interested in, which is that we currently sit in a juxtaposition where there are not regulations developed that would require businesses that plan to sell cannabis in our community to have to come before a community board. Um, and I, I don't speak for the community board necessarily as to what we want in that regard, but I think that there's definitely some interest in the community from about pop-up businesses that are selling or in some circumstances giving away cannabis and not out of, an, not out of a, a desire to be opposed to the legalization of cannabis, but just for an idea of a, a, a desire of the fact that like some of these businesses are popping up in the vicinity of schools. Um, what, what is there any update that can be said about the regulations or about the ability for there to be community involvement? And is there any message to the, that your office would give to community members who are concerned about this? So I don't have an update um, for you, but I will definitely deliver it to the Senator. I don't believe the Senator has a stance on that yet, um, but I can definitely circle back with our office, our legislative team, and we can definitely provide a message for you, okay? Thanks. Maria, thanks again. Once again, best of luck in your future endeavors. And don't be a stranger. You always have welcome to community board too. Thanks. Um, next, I'm going to call on John Watkins, uh, representing the district attorney's office for Kings County. Good evening, everyone. Hope all is well with you. 
Uh, Diego Gonzalez sends his well wishes. And as I would say, most days and evenings, uh, including Sundays, uh, Diego Gonzalez is, is out in the community, meeting with the public, informing them about what's going on with his administration and in the office. Also, uh, please always go to our website, which is brooklynda.org. I was just on it today. There's always new things on there, uh, things regarding embezzlement that uh, the DA's office is prosecuting persons for, and even uh, something like a school bus that was stolen uh, in our community and wrecked several vehicles. So those types of things are on our website, including, of course, much more serious things involving shootings and, and, and other very uh, serious uh, crimes. So it's brooklynda.org, and it's updated with press releases and, and news items uh, most days. And that includes a lot of the events that the DA is a part of and facilitates, including uh, some of our uh, events such as uh, Black History Month, uh, the Asian uh, community celebration, uh, and of, of course, uh, Hispanic heritage, which is coming up as well. And so I would encourage you to visit that website. And as most of these events now are virtual, uh, hopefully we'll, before too long, be able to get back to you know face-to-face -face events. But please, they're very informative and uh, you can register and log on to those events. Most uh, currently, I just realized, uh, I saw in our office that the problem of vaccine card fraud is uh, rampant and growing. And this is something that Diego Gonzalez is very aware of and, and he and his uh, team of ADAs are looking into. And this is something that's very recent that's just happened uh, in terms of our offices prosecuting these types of and investigating these types of, of crime incidents. So that's kind of breaking news, if I can say that. And so I would encourage you to you know, be cognizant about uh, fraudulent activities. And if you go to our website, uh, you'll find on our Action Center, our phone number, where if anyone is aware of such uh, types of crimes uh, that are being uh, occurred, or occurring in our community, to please uh, let our office know, because it's quite serious. And the last thing is the, uh, this is the Chinese Lunar New Year. Uh, Diego Gonzalez sends out his well wishes to our, our Asian community, as well as to all in the community for a very safe, happy and prosperous New Year. That's all I have for right now. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Um, Hazra has a question. Pardon me. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Brandon was speaking about the smoke shops. I know it's not relevant now that we moved over to the speaker, but um, I own a, a retail store that closed during COVID. And while I had it up for rent, I had several people coming and trying to rent it to make it into a smoke shop. And from their information, I found out that they did claim not to sell tobacco products and therefore they don't need the licensing that requires the, the requirements that a, a store that is selling tobacco products require. So they're almost operating without any any oversight. Because, you know, if you're going to apply for tobacco license, there is some oversight. Because they're claiming not to be selling tobacco, there is no oversight on them. So I, I guess the board should, and the elected should do some inquiry, further inquiry into those. Thank you. Was that directed to me? I'm sorry. Uh, that, that was really just more of an information for all of us that are on the phone and, and on the line. And we'll see what we can do to support um, what Ms. Ali raised because it really talks about oversight and some level of enforcement. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ferrara? Um, I don't know if it was appropriate. I was on a webinar about cannabis business in New York City last week. Um, they did reference community boards, but they were very vague and it definitely does not sound like it will be the same as the um, you know, license for alcohol. It, it, it was definitely stated that community board will weigh in and as always they could write letters and you know, submit them with their, uh, you know, what the community is feeling, any objective objections, but they did not at all state there was any sort of oversight in that way. Um, I believe it's 500 feet from schools is the requirement. And um, like anything, of course, it's going to be an extensive application process and there will be oversight. Um, no one should be giving out free anything. If anyone is giving out samples right now, it's 100% illegal. There is zero program uh, that is happening. But apparently people are saying that 
you know, they're allowed to give out uh, under some guise and uh, word from the state was that is absolutely uh, untrue. That, that is, that's all I know. Thank you. Um, so I don't see any other representatives listed for any elected officials. If you happen to be um, on the line and we're not called upon, if you just identify yourself in the chat, um, we can represent you or have acknowledge you and have you represent your principal. Um, if not, we're going to proceed to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, committees to report. We're going to start with uh, economic development and employment. Hey, thank you, Chair Singletary. Uh, I'm Bill Flanoy. I'm the chair of the Economic Development and Employment Committee. I want to also recognize my co-chair, Denise Peterson, and also my secretary, Kate Gilman. Uh, on February 1st, uh, we actually had a meeting uh, that was very interesting. Uh, at the meeting, we had Rochelle Pauling, the Assistant VP of Hiring and Training at, and Workforce Development at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, she just became a new hire as of November, and we were basically getting an introduction and uh, finding out what was the updates as far as what was going on in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, currently, right now, they're looking to do an employment center uh, reopening uh, in person for the individuals who are looking for uh, work opportunities. Uh, that will be on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and that'll be there in person. Otherwise, you continue to do outreach to them online. Okay, for those individuals who can't get online, this is an opportunity for them to reach out to them in person and find out what the opportunities are there. Uh, in addition to that, they're looking to start their adult training uh, summer program for 2022. Um, they're going to be giving updates on the type of training and when that training will occur. So just keep their breast with that and reach out to them on a regular basis unless you're on their mailing list. Uh, in addition, uh, they are also looking to do union panels. What the union panels are, are not opportunities to actually get trained, but the unions are looking to have panels coming on board and telling you what you need to do as far as how to become a union member, uh, what type of skills you need, where to apply, the funding and so forth and so on to do that. Again, this will be on site. And the reason why they're doing this is because the Brooklyn Navy Yard is expecting to do major construction in the near future, okay, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And they want the uh, residents in the area to have opportunities to actually get employed at the Navy Yard for these jobs. So they're actually being preemptive to actually try to help these individuals in the, the immediate neighborhood to actually uh, get certified so they can actually get these jobs. So that's something that they're doing right now. Uh, the internship, internment, uh, internship for uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard for college students and high school seniors, that's an eight week intern, internship. Uh, that's gonna be starting up shortly. Uh, those individuals who are interested in doing this should actually start making applications to them. And uh, also we discussed with the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, how they can actually uh, greatly increase their outreach to the community. Uh, currently right now there is outreach community but we want to actually make it actually broaden that outreach and they actually asked the committee on how they actually do this and if we could actually help them several committee members actually had some very good uh ideas for them and currently right now we're doing an exchange back and forth on where those connections are uh within the community and also the NYCHA housing um as far as the committee itself, uh, we give an update on the unemployment uh, numbers in the district, and also uh, we're looking for business status updates and what's going on. Some of the individuals have already mentioned uh, what was going on as far as a lot of the small businesses and also uh, women and minority businesses are actually being forced out because of some of the items that were brought up just now, such as uh, rent uh, and things along those lines. So we're having a discussion about that and how we can actually help these individuals. Um, one of the other things we discussed, which has already been addressed, was we were discussing the new rezoning of districts within the area. And Senator uh, uh, Brisport actually already addressed that and actually explained to us what was going on. But this was prior to the uh, mapping, the maps coming out. So we were concerned about that. Uh, I also asked the individual uh, committee members if there's any projects that they were interested in and in actually exploring to actually then bring forth to the committee to actually say, you know, this is something that we think is, in, is uh, an issue for the district, and we should actually explore this in a little more detail. Some of those things are, for instance, the NYCHA outreach, which I've already mentioned, and also uh, the minority and women uh, enterprise, uh, sorry, and, uh, entrepreneurs in the area that are looking for help and how we can actually help them out. Uh, and after that, uh, basically, I have a meeting with the CLS board on the 17th, and 
pretty much that's it after that. Uh, if there's any, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair Singletary, that's my report. Mr. Singletary. Thank you, Thank you Bill. Next committee to report, um, Parks and Recreation. Uh, good evening again, Mr. Singletary. Uh, I'm Barbara Zoller-Gringer, the chair, along with a number of the members of my committee and my co-chair, Andrew Lastowecki. We actually, I actually reported on our most recent meeting at our last meeting. Uh, our next meeting is Monday evening, uh, February 14th, and we will have a representative from Trees New York, which is a tree steward, stewardship and advocacy organization on behalf of trees. Among their um, activities is they plant trees, they train people to take care of trees. And um, I, I, I don't have to tell you how important trees are to a community, especially nowadays uh, during climate change concerns. So that's our, uh, one of our discussions for uh, Monday evening, as you know, we are, um, our committee members have been looking at other community boards to see what, if any, subject matters they combine with parks in their committees and um, what kinds of subject matters those committees have been looking at. So we will have a continued report on that as well Monday evening. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Next committee to report is on transportation and public safety. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm Sydney Meyer. I'm the chair. We don't currently have any co-chairs. Uh, John Quinn serves as the secretary ably. I'm happy to report that we're getting two new members of the committee. Esther Blout and Nicole Murray have been uh, have been appointed to the committee and will be joining us on the 17th. At our, our last meeting, we spent a considerable time going over what our goals for the year will be. And one of the goals is to try to get DOT to come to the meeting every uh, every week. And, and I will talk to that more with our city councilman and to, uh, to Len and see if we can get them to do. But I'm happy to announce that they will be coming to the February 17th meeting. Uh, we went over what's going on with, with, with the, uh, uh, in, in public safety. And I'm also glad to report that at our next meeting, the 84th precinct, the 88th precinct, and PSA number three will be attending the meeting to discuss uh, uh, safety issues. And I encourage our uh, committee members, if, if, if they can think about questions to ask them beforehand, we can provide that to them so that we might be able to get a more precise response on some of the issues. And obviously one of the issues that, that was raised tonight about the marijuana stores and enforcement issues, I'm sure will be one of the issues that we raise with the 8-4. Uh, th that's really all my re uh, report for this evening. As I said, DOT is also gonna be coming to the meeting uh, on the 17th and the what they're going to what they've at least announced to us so far that they're going to discuss is the changes they made uh, in the BQE last summer that you know changed it from uh, three lanes to two and how that impacts on the community. I would hope also hope that they would come and give us some more information about what they're doing with the triple cantilever and what's what the next steps are that that is on on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Next committee to report is the Youth Education and Cultural Affairs. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Singletary. Um, I'm Betty Feibush, Chair of Youth Education and Cultural Affairs. My uh, co-chair is uh, Dorothea Thompson Manning. Uh, we had a very interesting report from the Irondale um, Theater at the historic Lafayette Presbyterian Church. Uh, Terry uh, Grease, who's the uh, director for many years, uh, spoke very eloquently about uh, the theater. The mission there is to create and use theater to help people solve the problems of the moment that we're in, the moment that we're living in, and sees the, the people who are presenting, we are citizen artists. 
So they're, they're creating work based on the uh, current social political uh, landscape. Their current project is very interesting. It's called To Protect, Serve and Understand. And the uh, members of that uh, theater troupe are divided between police officers and civilians. And the NYPD members, they're actually paid for their time, or in other words, they're doing it during work time, you know, officially. And the civilians are also paid because, you know, everybody should have, uh, you know, equal recognition of their time and work. And they're learning to really listen to each other, to be in each other's shoes, to, to listen and to be able to talk to the other person's, you know, point of view to, to take on being in their shoes. So the, this uh, performance is going to be on March 25th and 26th. And we're invited and people should call the theater for tickets and so on. But this is really important uh, cultural work uh, of the moment. So it was very impressive. Uh, and that's my report of our last meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Our next committee to report is mm -hmm. Finance and Personnel Committee. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Leonard Jordan, and I'm the uh, chair of the Finance and Personnel Committee. Give me on my uh, laptop, my iPad, my yeah. So you, I might be cut off a little bit. But uh, just to report, the committee has met several times since the district manager vacancy was announced. Uh, the committee has commenced interviews, and actually soon, very soon, we will be submitting to the general board candidates to be considered for the district manager position. Uh, one of the things uh, that we would that we went by is the and I'll just read this. This is in our bylaws, Article 19, Section 4, C, uh, Section C and D. A minimum of three candidates for district managers shall be presented to the board for consideration. There shall be 10 days written notice to each board member as to the date, time, and place of the meeting to vote upon the selection of a district manager. Including in this notice shall be each candidate's resume. All of the information on file concerning each candidate shall be available to each board member of the community board. At the community board two office, I don't, I'm not sure about that one just yet, but prior to the election and at the board meeting at the time of the election. Uh, we will get that information out to everyone, of course, uh, before the, uh, the vote is taken. Uh, we also asked uh, everyone to be uh, to have a video uh, representation there that is to be on your you know computer iPhone uh, computer phone or tablet so that you're able to uh, to vote. So we're figuring out uh, how that process is going to go. Um, so uh, that's so so far that is my report, uh, Mr. Singletary, and uh, I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, I see some hands raised, so let me start with uh, Mr. Flanoy. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Jordan, I realize we're looking to replace the uh, board manager, but what about the other positions um, as far as fulfill? Because currently right now we're shorthanded. What's the time yeah. frame on that? Yeah, uh, well, uh, we want to do, we want to replace the district manager first because uh, that has to be voted on by the board. We also have the other uh, positions uh, in our sites, and they will that will be uh, forthcoming right after the district manager's name. And if I can, I can't give you it. I can't give you an exact time frame, uh, Bill, but I'm sure it will be very, very soon. And if I could add, we are um, getting the final approvals for the community associate position, and that will be posted shortly. Mr. Du? Yes, Chair Singletary. Um, the Finance and Personnel Committee met a couple of weeks ago, and I called in to hear what was going to be discussed, thinking that board members could participate in this portion of the meeting. And I was not permitted to stay for the full portion of the meeting because of, I'm not quite sure why because the hiring of personnel does not exclude any board members. 
So I'm not quite sure why I was asked to leave. But before I left, I did make certain comments to the personnel committee that I don't know if you want me to share it, what I said to the personnel committee, maybe I will share it to the personnel, to, to the full board. Uh, Carol Ann Church, and I'm using her name, uh, has acted as the district manager for 13 months. She was never given the title as district manager, acting district manager, even though uh, uh, she could have gotten that title and still kept the district manager position open until it was filled. Ms. Church left community board too. How is it that she could do the work of a district manager for 13 months and not be awarded the title for the work that she's done? I'm unclear. I can't imagine that she wasn't frustrated in that. And I will share with community board too that I hired Carol Ann Church to the community board when I was chair of community board too. I didn't go through all the machinations that are being discussed this evening. So I am concerned that board members were excluded from a meeting and that exclusion is not justified. Uh so, Mr. Singletary, I'm going to take the first part of that. So, Mr. Dew, we were in executive session, and whenever we're talking about personnel issues, uh, we're allowed to go into executive session. We did open up the meeting uh, as an open meeting, and then there was a motion to go into executive session. You had missed that part of it, uh, and that's the way we've been operating, uh, you know, all through. Although, eventually, uh, the full board has to approve um, or vote on, you know, the candidates that we have selected. So uh, that's the reason why we, you know, we had asked you to leave. Um, now, uh, as far as Ms. Church is concerned, uh, she was the assistant district manager. And on occasion, even when Mr. Paris was here, uh, Ms. Church, uh, when he was absent or out of the office for some reason uh, or, or not, uh, Ms. Ms. Church had filled in at those times also. But that doesn't answer the question. It really doesn't, Mr. Gordon. I understand that's the best you can come up with. But the fact is she functioned effectively as a district manager for 13 months, and she did not get anywhere near the title so that when she calls up to advocate for Community Board 2, she does not have that authority that goes along with that title. That's just a given. And, and there's no way around that. And the other piece that you mentioned, and you could stop after I say this, is that the law actually prescribes those items that are in executive session that excludes other board members. And it did not include what the personnel committee was doing in the executive session that I was asked to leave from. You were doing questions that you were going to pose to those prospective candidates. That is something that every board member could participate in. It happens to be something that I've done for my career, yet I could not share it with community boards. And that's why we have a community board of 50 board members. So we have different folk from different backgrounds that can share and make it a better place. Thank you. So, well, Mr. 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 Jordan, Mr. Okay. Jordan, I, okay. I, I, let me just chime in for a minute. Okay. There were aspects of the meeting that required us to go into executive session because um, the discussion included some some discussion around salary. Discussion included some conversation around how we were going to proceed. And it also included consideration of staff members who had applied to be considered. And so while um, the portion of the committee meeting that you participated in, while short, didn't really give you a clear snapshot of the overall conversation that was taking place in conjunction with what you've heard. So that level of sensitivity was taken 
because it takes full consideration of all the applicants as to why we went into um, executive session. And so second to that, while Carolyn um, was consistently recognized um, and still does because she's still an employee as the assistant district manager, uh, in my daily conversations with Carolyn, I am not aware that there was any degradation in her being respected and representing CB2 to the extent that changing the, the title from acting district manager or assistant district manager uh, made a material impact in how she represented and performed her job. And then she engaged with the um, agency. I mean, further to that, as witnessed by everyone, I think Carolyn has raised the bar, quite frankly, um, independent of whatever her title is, because of the expertise and the skill set she brought to this board and was able to shine on a platform that really amplified that, which is what led to her transition to this new opportunity. Ms. Gelbs? You on mute? Uh, yeah, I have one question. I think I did. I'm still muted? No, we can't hear you. Okay. Can you tell me how many applicants you receive and um, how many you've, you've, you've um, compressed it down to so that we'll be voting on? So we're gonna, the committee is gonna make that presentation and as per the bylaws, they're still, um, still actively evaluating the process. And so um, I won't answer the second part of that, but I can tell you that the, thus far the community board received um, 12 applicants, 12 applications for the position. And so we're calling it down to, uh, to a, a number that's in, uh, in consistency and represents what the bylaws have stated. Okay, thank you. I'm sure. glad to hear we, we got more than one or two. Oh no, we definitely got more than one or two. No question. Ms. Ali? Yes, my question is uh, again about Caroline. Um, I'm really saddened that we would be losing her. But I would like to know, although she did not receive the title, did it mean that she, because she didn't get the title, she couldn't get the additional remuneration that went along with that title? No, no, not at all. So why wasn't she given the, the additional money to bridge the extra work that she was doing? What makes you think she wasn't? Well, I haven't heard any, anything okay, to the that's contrary. Not, not hearing that versus making the presumption that she wasn't are two separate things. So, so are you saying emphatically that she was given? Carol, Carol Ann was given as voted on by the Finance and Personnel Committee an increase in salary that was commensurate with the work that she performed. She and Taya for that matter, the office performed during that 13 month period. Okay, I'm happy to hear that, but I'm really saddened that she's leaving the board. Uh, Sarah, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Well, uh, my question is also about Carolyn. Was she ever considered for the position? Yes, she was. And, and let me be really transparent in that context. Carolyn was considered for the position. Um, I think it's safe to say that she was highly considered for the position. <laughs> Conversation was had with her about the intent of having her strongly considered for the position. And what Carol Ann recognized or she communicated that she sat back and evaluated the two opportunities. And it was a hard decision, but what she communicated to me um, and you, you all are free to engage with her is that she felt that this opportunity, given her a larger purview working for the borough president's office, um, was uh, puts her on a path that allows her to do more than what she's currently doing or would be doing as a district manager. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Jordan, thank you for your report. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Next item on the agenda, uh, city agencies and community partners. I'd ask that each city agency and community partner, um, if you would, please identify yourself in the chat and we'll begin to, to call you. I'm gonna start with our good friends from the Brooklyn Public Library. 
Good evening, this is Tracy from Clinton Hill. Um, I am happy to announce that Brooklyn Public Library now has a new digital literary associate for older adults. Her name is Rania Baker and you can contact her by email or by phone. I'll put them in the chat. She'll help with screen readers, smartphones, computer support, virtual programs, social media, and Microsoft and Mac software. We've already referred people to her and everyone thinks she's just great. So any older adults who needs any form of assistance with smartphones or computers, they can make an appointment with her and she can help them virtually. In addition, Clinton Hill is doing, in addition to our three virtual book discussions, we're also gonna be doing a special meditation Monday for older adults. It's a combination meditation and arts and crafts. That's gonna be two Mondays in February. I'll put that in the chat. And we're doing a special Black History Month virtual monthly movie or trivia event too, which I'll also put in the chat. We're also still doing our virtual arts and crafts programs and story times for children, which you can see on our Facebook page. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel from Brooklyn Heights. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for letting us speak. As always, I just wanted to share a few things that are happening um, at uh, Brooklyn Heights Library, which is currently offering lobby service out of the Center for Brooklyn History at 128 Pierpont Street. Uh, we are going to be having a virtual event uh, tomorrow, February 10th at 2 p.m., a Riding to Wellness workshop in partnership with New York Project Hope. There's still time to register. If you'd like to um, buck up your wellness toolkit and write a little bit uh, to improve your mental health, please join us tomorrow. Uh, on February 17th at 11, we'll be having effective communication strategies um, for those um, dealing with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers to help you communicate and connect with those experiencing Alzheimer's. So you can sign up as well for that. And we do look forward to beginning craft, um, grab and go craft kits, um, partnering with the Center for Brooklyn History, um, focusing on items in their collection starting next week. Um, in addition to that, um, Brooklyn Public Library is offering tax help again this year. Um, you do have to apply online. Um, most branches do have federal and state tax forms, but please do call ahead to make sure your branch has them. Um, and you make an appointment online. A central library is offering them with AARP as well as the food bank. Flatbush Library is offering um, has, um, tax help as well in addition to new lots. So various organizations are helping uh, provide the free hour long appointments to get help with taxes. And with no further ado, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Kat Savage. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kat from the Adam Street Library in Dumbo, uh, here to share a couple uh, quick updates just to round off uh, my colleagues' statements. Um, hey, did you know that you can prepare for U.S. citizenship at the Brooklyn Public Library? Um, Brooklyn Public Library offers a range of services, resources, and programming for those preparing to become citizens, which is so cool. Um, we offer classes, prep groups, and uh, legal services online. Um, the citizenship classes meet three hours per week. Uh, and are taught by experienced instructors. Um, there's also a drop-in weekly citizenship prep group led by a volunteer coach. Um, so you can give uh, a, a call to 718-230-2007 or email immigrantservices at brooklynlibrary.org for more information. And then I'll also add that branches all have a new Americans corner where there's a variety of free test prep materials, uh, including flashcards to study for those 100 questions um, and other materials as well for free. Um, at Adam Street Library, uh, we have hired uh, new children's librarians. Very exciting. She's doing virtual uh, story times and a Zoom uh, mommy moves baby wearing class, which is very cool. Uh, we're working on hiring in a new adult librarian. Um, so I'm hoping to have adult programming very soon as well. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're having a friends group. Uh, we're starting a friends group at Adam Street Library. Um, please, uh, if you're interested or know anybody that wants to get more involved with the new library, uh, please uh, have them uh, attend. I will pop those URLs for the citizenship and the friends group meeting in the chat. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you to the library.
Uh, the next name I see is um, Richard Morrow, the Red Corps. Thank you, Chair Singletary. Good evening. My name is Richard Morrow, and I'm the Greater New York Red Cross Community Relations Ambassador for Community Board 2. Around the country, there are presently 44 disaster relief operations. 40 are in the eastern portion of our country. All are climate related. This week, locally, we assisted 184 adults and 78 children following 50. 53 disaster relief operations. I wanted to bring you up to date on what the Red Cross is doing to, in the long term. Presently, the Red Cross is working with major universities around the country to learn lessons from COVID-19. Positioning regional food supply chains for future pandemics, natural disasters, and human-made disasters targeting rapid dispense response solutions to the pandemic through applied research, education, and extension activities. We plan to accomplish the following. Assess the impact of COVID-19 on farm and food supply chains operations by understanding consumers' behavior response regionally and across the U.S. Understanding the capacities and structural vulnerabilities of regional food systems to support their population needs. Developing resources and strategies for current and future disruptions and supply chain stakeholders and experts. Offering training programs to strengthen support and understanding for local and regional supply chain participants at times of disruptions. This is so important. We've seen most of us even now that the supply chain is, is a little shaky. So it's important that communities and community boards stress to their elected officials to uh, make this a pri priority in terms of uh, uh, the future events. Through our virtual programs, we can help you and your community by offering courses for free. With the easing of COVID-19 restrictions, our home fire alarm installation programs is back. If you know someone who is in need of one, please contact us at our website, redcross.org, for details, is, details and to view our programs. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. Next up, I have um, Eileen Lazinski from the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Well, Ellen, Hi, Ellen. Ellen. Yeah. Hi. I'm good sorry. evening, everyone. It's better. usually my last oh, name that messes people up, not the first name. So that was, <laughs> I know that was a new I'm one. Sure. I <laughs> last name pronunciation was perfect, though. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to give a couple quick updates. Uh, Bam is happy to announce that we are bringing music back to our spaces, putting the music in Brooklyn Academy of Music, a spring concert series coming to our Opera House, uh, Harvey Theater, and Fisher Building. Uh, Don Richard, Moses Sumney, and culminating with Mavis Staples in May, along with a, a whole slew of other performers. Um, another program I wanted to just highlight briefly is our ongoing senior cinema uh, series. It's every third Friday. Uh, we have a free film at 10 a.m. Uh, our, in our opera house, in our cinemas. On February 18th, uh, the next installment is a film called Through a Lens Darkly which is a documentary that explores the role of photography and the identity of African-Americans. That's completely free to anyone uh, 65 and older. Uh, we work with a lot of senior centers to get people to come out. We provide transportation. So uh, walk-ups are also welcome. Uh, and then just a bit of news. We just announced yesterday, we have a new incoming president who's going to be Take, taking office. I don't know if that's how it works with a, <laughs> a cultural institution in uh, April. We're really happy to welcome back our former uh, vice president of film and strategic programming, Gina Duncan, uh, who's just really wonderful. Uh, and we're very excited. The, the future feels very bright as we are slowly but surely emerging from this pandemic, which is something I think I've been saying for the last two years, but we're still emerging. So we're getting there. Uh, but thank you so much for allowing me to speak tonight, and, and that's about it for now. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> um, next, we're going to call up um, Ethan Mulligan, the Brooklyn ABR. 
Thank you, Chair, Chair Singletary. Um, I always appreciate Bill Flanoy's reports, um, but I really like them when he teased me up uh, for what I was going to say tonight, and that's to talk to you about the uh, summer internship program. So I'm going to pop the link in the chat before I go any further. If you want to follow along. I'll just wait for that person. There we go. Um, so we are excited to announce the Brooklyn Navy Yard Summer 2022 Internship Program. The summer internship program connects college attending students and college bound high school seniors to a wide range of paid oppor internship opportunities with businesses, with businesses within the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, over the course of an eight week session, students will be connected to yard based businesses and departments according to their career interests, skill sets and educational backgrounds. So there are actually two eight week sessions. Um, before I get to the dates there, I just want to tell you the deadline is Friday, February 25th at 4.59 p.m., so just shy of 5 o'clock. So Friday, February 25th is the deadline. Um, the applications are rolling, so the earlier someone can get them in, the better chance that they're matched uh, with a uh, business and program that they like. Um, ways to qualify for the internship program, you can either be from Brooklyn or uh, be attending college in Brooklyn. Um, so we're hoping again to connect as many local residents um, and community members um, with these internships. Um, it, we are asking folks to um, commit to a 40 hour work week um, with an hour lunch each day that equals 35 hours of uh, paid work each week at $15 an hour. So paid internships, there will also be professional development activities, including resume and interview workshops, career panels, networking events, uh, and more. So you can be placed with one of the over 450 businesses at the yard, the ones who apply um, to have interns, as well as with us, the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. And uh, just to give you, uh, we have positions available in the following fields, just to name a few, art, architecture, business administration, computer science, construction technology, civil engineering, culinary, electric electrical engineering, fashion, finance, film, graphic design, health, nutrition, science, uh, information tech, marketing, mechanical engineering, and urban sustainability. And that's just some of them. So sorry to rip through that quickly, but I just wanted you to know um, to tell folks who are either going to college um, who are college bound or in college now um, that these internships are available at the yard. Um, the only restriction is uh, you can't come three times. So this can either be your first time or your second time, um, but after that, we try to um, connect folks who it's their first or second time. Um, so that's it on the internship program. Um, again, the deadline is Friday, February 25th. And then the second thing I wanna talk about, uh, and I'll drop this link in as well. Um, I got to, I worked remotely today and I met my mom for coffee. Um, and we talked about her birthdays coming up at the end of this month. And uh, we've been celebrating her 40th since I was a young kid. Um, so we're excited for her 40th again this year. Um, but someone who doesn't have to worry about their age is the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and on February 23rd, the Navy Yard will be ce celebrating its 221st birthday. Um, so what we're gonna do is Turnstile Tours is gonna host a virtual program. Um, it's called Black History and Industry at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And we're looking at the past and present of black trailblazers and innovators at the yard. Um, the panel discussion will examine the vital role played by black sailors and ship workers since 1801, and also how the yard has been an engine for economic empowerment since it, since it became a city owned industrial park in 1969. And then in 1981, obviously the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation was formed. Um, and the panel will have entrepreneurs, artists and craftspeople in the yard, uh, as well as folks from BNYDC. And then the last link, I'm gonna encourage you to come on down um, Turnstile Tours has more tours, uh, walking tours of the yard that you can sign up for. Um, one, one left in February and three in March. Those are World War II tours, architecture and infrastructure tours, past, present and future, which is their, their typical one. Um, and the last thing with those tours, you can also come down um, if you don't want to take a tour into the yard. You can come anytime, still check out our art and object walk along Flushing Avenue, um, walk it from Wegmans all the way down to Building 77. Um, and on either end of that, there's food and drink opportunities, whether that's Wegmans and Kings County Distillery at the um, Navy Street side or on Vanderbilt so as you walk into 77, plenty of places to eat and also transmitter brewing. Um, so we hope you'll join us soon now that the weather is getting a little nicer, it's getting a little lighter. Um, 
come on down and see us. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Ethan. Um, I don't see any other community agencies or partners listed in the chat. So I'm going to move on to agenda item number 10, other board business. Uh, Ciro, uh, Mr. Scarlett, the, the item that you brought up at the beginning of the meeting, would you care to bring that item up now? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to bring up to revisit was the idea of the smoke shops. I, and I, I want to clarify what I'm saying. What I, what I want to talk about, we sh the idea of it being legalized, cannabis being legalized is fine. That, that, that shouldn't be on the table. It's a done deal. What my concern was when I chatted with Brandon and, and actually uh, Carol Ann was the fact that it's a new business, that these are new businesses that are coming on the scene. And when you have new businesses coming on the scene, basically there's a lot of things that you don't know or you do know about them. And you really need to understand what their modus operandi are, why they're doing it and what's happening. There's no reason why we should stop them from doing business. That's what we, we're here for. But my question basically is, we as a community should be at least involved in that type of business. That's a business that borders on some past history. We know that. So as community, people who live in the community, I would really wish that the community boards would have a say, just like we have a say of, with the license and renewal. It, it seems to me very simple to do that. I don't know why we were shut out of it, but there are, uh, these stores are popping up. There's one diagonally across from PS8 in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, there's one now on Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights. Also, there are very two of them that have just opened up. And I reached out to other community board members. I wondered if they were opening up in their communities too. I just think that there should be some uh, regulation, some, some legality where they would have to comply with some issues so that the community feels safe. We know we have underage kids walking around uh, there. They the, they're very, very enticed by this and there should be some maybe of the legal age. And uh, I think Mr. Ferreira mentioned the fact that uh, there's this idea that they could give it away. There's been some discussion and gossip about the fact that they're thinking about that's a good way of getting around the law when you make a gift. If someone goes and buys something in the smoke shop that they're buying a paraphernalia there's a sort of a there's been some talk i'm not saying i know this for certain that there's a possibility they would give some gift of some uh marijuana so all i'm saying is there's a lot of hearsay there's a lot of discussion there's interest as a community board i would hope uh mr chairman that we could take a lead in this community board and try to encourage the state or the city to at least add some say on the community from the community board. We really are right on the main topic. We're right here. We're the grassroots issue. And that's, I would like the community, if I have any comments from my co-members, co I'd love to hear their comments too. But I really would encourage us all to possibly talk to our electeds and maybe do a concerted uh, letter or uh, whatever we can do to let them understand that this is, a, this is something we should be aware of. In five or 10 years, we don't know what's going to happen, but we should start taking care of it now. Thank you. So thank you for those comments. I don't, I don't think anyone disagrees with anything you said, and we will proceed with trying to make sure that the, the community board can take, the, take an active role and we'll work through um, a solution and keep the board abreast of how we make progress with that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Can I just Mr. make a Duke, comment? Mr. Duke, Mr. Duke. Um, Mr. Duke. John, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. I did want to report that Borough President Reynoso met with the Vanderbilt Avenue Block Association in regards to the closure of the Gates Avenue slip that goes from Vanderbilt and Fulton Street, which is uh, the result of the death of a child that had nothing to do with that. But in any event, I'm just reporting to the community board that the borough president in his second week met with the Vanderbilt Block Association, which is promoting the closure of that slip and turning that whole space into a park. The community board transportation committee was fully represented and was able to speak to issues that are related 
to the larger community. And the last item I had is the sidewalk sheds. There's been some finality to what's going to happen that uh, we're all very interested in understanding what those final impacts are going to be that were recently approved by the city council. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Ms. Thurston? Sorry, thanks, Lenny. My comments will be quick. Um, I don't mean to open up a whole discussion. I totally agree that we'll figure out the marijuana piece of this later, but I, I do want to say I think it's absolutely all of our responsibility to not spread misinformation and to not conflate things. Smoke shops are not medical marijuana dispensaries. They are completely different and medical marijuana dispensaries are necessary in our community. I, I'm someone that can't sleep. Um, there's a lot of reasons that people have medical marijuana cards and suffice it to say, yes, there should be a community voice, but there is so much history to the illegalization of marijuana that I suggest we all serve as advocates for the importance of this health and well wellness need in our district and be very cautious about conflating things um, on the topic. Emily. Thank you, Jessica. Just quickly wanted to say that if anyone had been following the news this week, specifically the city actively this week started ticketing and finding businesses that are popping up that are not doing the right things so to Jessica's point that are not medical marijuana dispensaries, which are necessary and needed. Um, and so they are the, the, um, resulting penalties or fines. And in many cases, any of those businesses that are already operating without a license, because there are no licenses yet for recreational, will likely not be able to actually get a license when the process starts. So the city actively this week started cracking down. And so I don't have the information handy, but I can certainly get it to Taya um, because there, there, there is officially now someone within the city to contact if you are seeing places that are popping up, handing out candy, those trucks, whatever. Um, but again, they will not be, they will not get to take part in what they're trying to jump the gun on, so. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, can I just respond to Ms. Thurston for one second? I, I, actually, no, I don't want to do this back and forth. I, okay. I think this is something that we can do collaboratively offline, and your points were well taken, as were the other follow-up comments from Jessica and Emily. So I know in, a, in the spirit of being, conge being collective and working together in a collegial fashion, thank you. So let me move on to item number 11, community forum. This is where non-community board members have a chance to identify any concerns or issues that you wanna make us aware of, or even just things that are more informational. And I'd ask that if you um, do, would like to have a moment to speak from a community forum, that you indicate yourself, um, your first and last name in the chat, if you will, and then allow us to um, hear from you for uh, a maximum, hopefully, of two minutes. So is there anyone from the community that would like to speak at this time? With that, I'll go to the next item on the agenda, item number 12. So item number 12 is where we generally have a light discussion about how we end this meeting. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second, Ms. Fibers, is there any discussion on the motion? Everyone have a good evening, get home safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Hey, Amula, can you hear me? Thank you. Good night. Good night, good night everyone. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Hey, Good night. Good night. This is called from Gordon. Good night. Okay, good night. I guess you're good gone. Good night. 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 I think we're done tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.